Thank you for joining the USC Schwarzenegger Institute and the USC Soul Price Center for Social Innovation for a virtual event titled Unhoused, Addressing Homelessness During and After the Pandemic. Good morning. I'm former State Senator Fran Pavley and was honored to represent parts of Western LA and portions of Ventura counties in the legislature between 2000 and 2016. But today, it's my distinct pleasure as the Environmental Policy Director on behalf of the Schwarzenegger Institute team and the Soul Price Center for Social Innovation to welcome you to this timely and very important discussion. The Center for Social Innovation and the Schwarzenegger Institute have teamed up once again, the first time right before the pandemic, to discuss the complex issues surrounding homelessness and how the pandemic further shaped this issue. And today we have a panel of experts joining us to address some of the short and long-term challenges and solutions facing our communities. I wanna thank all of the distinguished speakers today and you can see their biographies online, not only for taking the time to participate in our event, but also for the great work they do every day in regards to homelessness. I have read your impressive biographies and have met even one of your very newest speakers, Assemblymember Isaac Bryan. I look forward to hearing from him. A special shout out to all of today's speakers and all of our partners at the Soul Price Center for Social Innovation for your compassion and your leadership. And now I would like to introduce Professor Gary Painter. Gary is both the director of the USC Soul Price Center for Social Innovation and the director of the Homelessness Policy Research Center. He has extensive expertise in urban economics and housing and will be providing an overview of some of his research and how this pandemic has impacted housing and homelessness issues. Take it away, Professor Painter. So I wanna invite our audience in addition, and thank you again for that introduction. Um, our, our mission at the Price Center is to develop ideas and illuminate strategies to improve the quality of life for people in low-income areas. Um, in this context, it's, we, we all wanna solve complex problems with social innovation approaches. And I think everyone would agree that homelessness and increasing numbers of people experiencing homelessness is such a problem, and we need to bring new approaches to solving it. Um, I invite our audience who is with us live today to engage in conversation on social media with us, um, with our symbols we have uh, at Price, uh, at USC Price CSI and at HPRI underscore LA, or if you want to tag me directly, as you see, it's at Gary Dean Painter. So what we saw before the pandemic is, is important to kind of reflect on. Um, and in fact, those are the only data we have to date because data collection efforts were hampered in 2021. But when we first had an event with the Schwarzenegger Institute, we kind of took stock in terms of where we were and how we got there. Um, as you see in these data currently there, or as of 2020, uh, pre-pandemic, we had 580,000 people experiencing homelessness. 61% um, nationwide were sheltered and 39% were unsheltered. In Los Angeles County, it's a slightly different picture, um, in particular because the majority of our people experiencing homelessness are unsheltered, 72.3%. A number of these people live in their cars or RVs, um, but only 27% are actually in shelters or interim housing of one type or another. Um, the number of people experiencing homelessness in LA County has steadily risen over the last decade. Now, uh, as of 2020, again, pre-pandemic, we had 66,000 people experiencing homelessness. And of increasing concern, the number of older adults experiencing homelessness had increased by 20%. We reflected on in our previous event, what were the main drivers of these increases in homelessness, both nationwide and in particular, 
in California, and in Los Angeles. And we focused on these three critical contributors. The first is constrained housing supply. As we reflected, it isn't a single bill. It's not a single action taken by a local government that got us to the point where we have deficits of over a million units in California. And it's not going to be a single bill or action taken that's going to get us out of that problem. Um, the problem causes rents to go up um, when you constrain supply, when there's demand for people living. Um, what we have seen is some actions taken, and I applaud those actions. S Senate Bill SB9 and SB10 are ways to increase housing supply by changing single family zoning to allow for duplexes and fourplexes in appropriate ways, and also to increase density in certain transit corridors and commercial um, areas. Both of these bills are important first steps. Um, again, they're not gonna be the bill to solve our constrained housing supply problem, but they are one of many steps that have to be taken to get us where we need to go. It's not just constrained housing supply or increasing rents that led us here, but it's also the fact that our incomes are not keeping up with the rent increases. So that's a concept that we call rent burden. And in California, over 50, per, I'm sorry, 1.2 million households pay more than 50% of their income as rent. That's what we call severe rent burden. All of these people are at risk. If there is a large bill that they experience, whether in healthcare or some car, whatever the case might be, of not being able to pay the rent. And so we have to do something about this concept of severe rent burden. We have to support these families. Of course, part of that support is to make sure building can happen so that rents don't go up so fast. And the final point that we highlighted was the fact that our, our people experiencing homelessness have been subject to institutional and systemic racism. What we observe in the homeless population is that roughly a third of the homeless population is black, are black people, um, while only 9% of the county's um, population are black. And you see similar kinds of overrepresentation among indigenous populations as well. Something has to be done in our systems that are you know, much broader than just housing, but we see it in terms of housing discrimination and segregation. We see it in the criminal justice system. We see it in lots of systems that contribute to this disproportionality among, especially in LA, the black population. So that's where we work. What happened during the pandemic? What can we see? I think there's two things I want to highlight. First, I want to address the fact that um, that you may be wondering, you know, how has COVID directly affected the people who are people who are experiencing homelessness? Um, and we'll do that, and then we'll talk about what were some of the actions taken by the public sector um, and perhaps private sector actors to to actually reduce the amount of people experiencing homelessness to address the pandemic's impact on people experiencing homelessness. And with that, we might learn some lessons about what we ought to do as we come out of the pandemic. So overall in LA County, there were 9,203 people um, as of September, uh, the end of September who had contracted COVID-19. You can see with this distribution, um, the majority of those were within the ages of 30 to 59. Um, we also see, though, that nearly 38% of cases were for people who were over 50 for whom we know that the disease is, is much more dangerous. Um, we saw that the COVID cases um, varied by whether people um, experiencing homelessness were sheltered or unsheltered. Um, in terms of the, we, we saw that the cases were highest among the sheltered, and that makes sense because if you're with someone else who may have the virus, you're more likely to contract it um, versus people who were actually living unsheltered, which, which were only 28% of the pe population of people who contracted COVID. Um, but in terms of deaths and in terms of hospitalizations, we saw that there was a higher rate of, of people who were unsheltered, then went to the hospital, and then some of them died. And that's because we know that if you're living unsheltered, you're much more likely to experience adverse health events. And so they're actually at, at much greater risk. That's what we know about how COVID were impacting people experiencing homelessness from the perspective of health. In fact, um, the, basically the, 
the rate of infection, hospitalizations, and deaths were actually quite similar to the waves that we experienced um, in the general population, especially the population who were extremely low income. So there weren't huge differences there, in part because of some of the policies that were enacted to protect people experiencing homelessness. Um, the impact of COVID, though, is not has not just been on people experiencing homelessness, but also people who are at risk of experiencing homelessness. And so I think it's important to say something about the rental market and also the actions taken to help people stay housed in the rental market. Um, these consequences um, could be devastating and people have been worried about kind of a, a, a a really wave of evictions that might happen as people were unable to pay. And so, as you know, there have been eviction moratorium, there's been rental assistance programs, which I'll detail more in a minute. But during this time, because landlords are not receiving rents, it's been reported that 27% of rents, I'm sorry, 27% of landlords have ignored maintenance requests because they just perhaps don't have the money to address these or don't want to address them because they're not getting paid. 28% have purposely deferred um, uh, maintenance. And these are from two different surveys. So the numbers line up pretty, pretty well. But in LA County, there was a survey done by colleagues at UCLA and USC who estimated that there's actually a total of $3 billion in back rent still owed to landlords as of um, two months ago. So this is an issue that remains salient. When we looked at kind of the range of policies, both to address people who are experiencing homelessness, to reduce the number, to reduce risk of COVID, and people who may be at risk of becoming homeless, they fall into these categories. So we had a, pro a, a policy called Project Room Key. We had another one called Project Home Key that I want to highlight. And then we have had large scale rental assistance programs and eviction moratorium to protect people who weren't able to pay their rent because of job losses. And recently there's been a increase in emergency housing vouchers. Project Room Key and Project Room uh, Home Key were, were quite innovative in the moment. These were emergency measures. It wasn't clear how well they would work. Project Room Key was a program that noticed that there were a lot of hotels and motels that weren't being used because COVID shut down travel, and that this could be a real opportunity to house our unhoused neighbors. Um, so what they did is they provided non-congregate shelter options for the homeless population. They were targeting the people who were most at risk. So if you had contracted COVID, we would want to move you from a interim housing situation where you might expose others to a, a isolated situation. If you were at risk, if you contracted COVID, so if you were an older person experiencing homelessness, you were prioritized into Project Room Key. And then finally, if you had been exposed to someone with COVID, then you were prioritized to Project Room Key. So, so this was a program where initially we had um, here in LA County had identified the need for maybe up to 15,000 units. We were actually able to, um, and I'll, I'll say in a moment, just let me, just to stay on this slide for a moment, we're also going to talk about Project Home Key. I'll talk about that in a moment, but kind of going deeper on Project Room Key, um, you can see that the number of people housed in Project Room Key ramped up quickly. And I think this is an important lesson for us that we can house people who are experiencing homelessness rapidly if we have the resources and the plan and ready to go with that plan. And while we did have an ambitious goal of housing 15,000 people in this program, we got over 4,000, which is still a, a, an important step in demonstrating what we can do. In some ways, some of the challenges of Project Room Key were that some hotel and motel operators were unsure what would happen after Project Room Key ended, and so they just didn't want to participate in the program. Um, this is one reason that Project Home Key was was enacted as well. So Project Home Key, what it did is it allowed, um, with federal dollars and state dollars, it allowed um, our homeless service systems to actually purchase hotels and motels and other properties, but a lot of the focus has been on hotels and motels. Um, and, and we saw in that program that people who had not participated, um, owners of hotels and motels that had not participated in Project Room Key, then saw this as an opportunity to sell an asset at a good price um, that now we can use to either provide interim housing or permanent housing. Um, in, in this particular slide, you'll see that throughout different counties, different places are targeting kind of a different distribution of both interim and permanent housing. Nearly 80% of Project Home Key 
sites are slated to be permanent housing. Some of them are not yet permanent housing because they still need to be uh, rehabbed into permanent housing, like adding kitchens and the like to those places. And uh, uh, roughly 20% in different places are, are still slated to be just increase the interim housing stock. So those are two really important programs. Um, in fact, the governor uh, signed a bill that would allocate over the next three years roughly seven billion dollars to Project Home Key, um, and it it is the it may be the case that we're able to find that many hotel and motel operators to sell those units. If not, um, I'm I'm looking forward to the state legislature pivoting to find new ways to spend those resources to house our unhoused neighbors. Probably the largest program that was enacted by the federal government was a rental assistance program. Um, I was asked prior to this rental assistance program being enacted, what I thought was kind of the amount of money that might be available. And I was thinking nine or 10 billion was probably as much as the Congress would allocate under the Trump administration. Um, I was wrong and I'm glad I was wrong in this case. Um, we saw in 2020 that $25 billion was allocated through the COVID relief funding and the American Rescue Plan this year added another 21 billion. Um, as you have seen the estimates just in LA County of 3 billion, these monies are needed. The, this is the level of back rent that we're seeing. In fact, some people have estimated the back rent nationwide was even up to $70 billion. Um, these programs though, haven't quite been as effective as they could be or as rapidly implemented as they could be. Um, what we're seeing is that, you know, in, among the $5.2 billion that's been allocated for California, you know, rough depends on the county and so forth, but roughly about 50% of it actually is currently in people's hands. Um, what were what, what was allowed kind of as the eviction moratorium, which I'll speak about in a second, kind of ended is that as long as you had signed up for rental assistance, you couldn't be evicted um, as it's taking time to process this. And this is a lesson for us that not only rental assistance was needed, but you also need to make sure you have in place a plan to get money into people's hands. And some counties were better at it than others because of the infrastructure, both within the public sector and also within the civic sector more broadly. Um, I'll say something briefly about eviction moratoria. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, everyone has heard about the federal, state, and or local policies. We now are in a position where the federal and state eviction moratoria have expired. Some local protections remain in some counties, including LA County. And then the final temporary policy was to increase the number of vouchers um, in the, the nation by 70,000. This increases the amount of vouchers by roughly 3.2%. Um, and this, these are certainly sorely needed um, as we'll talk about in a second. I think as we have learned lessons from that, we learned that we can actually quickly take action to move people from living on the streets or other unstable housing situations into stable housing situations, if we have the will, if we have the plan, and if we have the resources to do so. But we need to start thinking even more about the long-term solutions. Um, myself and Dennis Colhane wrote a paper recently published in the European Journal of Homelessness that kind of puts out three possibilities, and on this slide I've actually added a fourth, of really direct actions that can be taken to support people who are currently instably housed, um, and also to help people who are experiencing homelessness. I don't have time today to go in detail on all of these. The first two is, is thinking about new ways to finance. So I've done a lot of work looking at social impact bonds as a new way to bring private capital and public capital together to develop innovative ways to both fund social services and also to enhance the current social services. I think that's an important way of just rethinking how we contract for social services, including uh, to serve people who are experiencing homelessness. There's also really important approaches to think about how we organize our efforts around uh, efforts to reduce homelessness here in LA County, California, and the nation. And so there are collective impact approaches. And again, I don't have time to go into detail, but they, they basically, a new way to govern ourselves, how to organize ourselves, how to work together. And I think these approaches need to be tested out and actually funded so that we can see if we could um, address our issues around homelessness better than we've done in the past. 
Um, I think it's important to think about our housing supports, our rental supports and housing vouchers and how we can extend them beyond just a, a, an emergency allocation, but extend them more broadly. And then we need to actually fund directly approaches to advance racial equity to address the systemic racism that I mentioned before. And so I just want to say something a little more about the kind of rental supports um, because I think people know that housing vouchers are out there. Um, housing vouchers is the most important federal government uh, program. Um, it, for most people, the housing voucher is the largest piece of the social safety net. If you don't get it, then you are there's no way that you can actually support yourself as a family to address all the needs that you have, just basic needs. Um, the problem with the housing voucher program is that over time, the number of people who are eligible has grown but the number of people receiving the housing church voucher has not. And so when I presented information in 2020, the ratio was one to four, meaning that one out of four people who are eligible received the voucher. New research says that's extended to one in five. So what this means is that you have a program that is only serving 20 to 25% of the population that needs this support. We have to think about what to do there. And so I think that a simple solution mechanically is to make the housing choice voucher program an entitlement program like our um, food support programs and our medical programs. Um, this is an expensive uh, next step and it actually requires an important plan because the way that the current program is set up, landlords are required to be willing to participate in the program in order to have a housing choice voucher go to a particular tenant. Um, and we know that it would take a lot of effort to recruit landlords to be part of that program. An alternative approach was advanced by then presidential candidate Kamala Harris and also then presidential candidate Cory Booker, who said that we should think about a rental tax credit, which is analogous to a mortgage interest tax deduction um, so that renters could have more support. And, and you, know, you could kind of think about it as a while you wait for your housing voucher, this population of low and moderate income households would have something to support and stabilize their housing. Um, you can do this lots of different ways. You can do it with the tax code. You could also imagine shallow subsidies for people paying more than half their income as rent. Why don't we take action at the state level to stabilize those households at least to the 50% level while the housing choice voucher would then close the gap to the 30% level in terms of the amount of income that's going to rent. Finally, as we're thinking about long-term solutions, it's essential to direct public and private investment to reduce the overrepresentation of Black and other marginalized populations experiencing homelessness. It's not like we don't have a plan on how to do this or examples on how to do this. We do. Um, the ad hoc report, uh, the ad hoc committee on Black people experiencing homelessness produced a report in 2019 that provided clear recommendations on how to improve data collection analysis how to increase capacity building, how to improve, to improve service delivery in particular communities where there was over-representation. Um, we have a clear plan there. We just need to implement and invest in it. In the paper that I cited before, um, Dennis Colhane was uplifting some, some lessons from stakeholder engagements in Philadelphia where they noticed that there was an increase in the population uh, of the Latino population experiencing homelessness, and they actually were able to invest in additional supports and language supports and, and other specific activities to address the, that growing number. It can be done, but the investment has to be there. I will kind of conclude my remarks in terms of where we are. It is, is not just, okay, we need to do these things, but do we need to recognize where we are right now? Um, where we are right now is just simply not acceptable. It's not acceptable, I think, to any community member. If you are running a business, it's not acceptable to you to have people who are sleeping on the streets in front of your business. If you are just a private citizen, a private resident who is walking your kids to school, it's not acceptable to feel unsafe as you walk your kids to school. It's not acceptable to have someone experiencing homelessness sleeping on the streets living in a tent. This is a human rights issue. And so I think all of us, and we saw in a recent uh, LA Times report, 95% of the population says this is a serious problem. Um, 
So we got to do something about it, right? There's been public pressure. Everybody wants to do something about it. But what we don't know is what is the most important kind of thing to do first. And we're seeing this pressure around anti-camping ordinances from the city council where people can experience homelessness versus where you can't. Um, that certainly worries me because it may like de facto create places where it's okay to be homeless. And I don't think that's tenable either. Um, there's been efforts on the Venice Boardwalk and Echo Park here in Los Angeles County um, to clean specific areas. Uh, I know that there's going to be an effort to look at MacArthur Park and to kind of rehab there. I mean, it, so we're in a situation where it's not tenable. We have to take broader action. Um, voters have been supportive in, in LA County um, for Measure H and Measure Triple H. Those are 10-year initiatives. Um, and as I said at the beginning with my remarks, we didn't get here overnight. Um, it wasn't just one policy or one misstep. It was a series of those missteps. So it's going to take time, but we need to be vigilant and, and to take that time. Voters will support if they're seeing progress. And I think that's where I'd like to transition a bit to our distinguished panel to talk a little bit about maybe what the next steps are from their vantage point and how we can actually have that clear and measurable progress. So with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague here at USC, Saba Muine. She is the Managing Director of the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. Um, she's just recently joined us in this role after 16 years of serving in various organizations um, in, in various efforts, most recently with the Corporation for Supportive Housing to address, um, and uh, I think I'll, I'll say it this way, which is quite aligned with the mission of the Homelessness Policy Research Institute, which is to accelerate culturally informed solutions to end homelessness. And, and these efforts over this period puts her in, in a great spot to become a, a true leader in ending homelessness in our region. And, and as, as she's joined us as the managing director of the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Saba Mwine to introduce our panel. Wonderful, thank you so much, Gary. And welcome everyone to the panel portion of our time together. Today, we have a chance to hear from a cross section of leaders in the fields of policy, housing and supportive services, as well as healthcare. Uh, we'll focus primarily on how COVID-19 has impacted the fight to end homelessness. The lessons learned from the many challenges and opportunities provided by the governmental response to a global pandemic and how to move forward. Uh, we'll begin with some very brief introduction of the panelists. Um, in the chat, you will find a link to their full bios. And then we will conclude with a Q&A section. So please do enter your questions um, to the panelists in the Q&A box. So I will start with our intros. Um, we have with us Assembly Member Isaac Bryan who was elected in May 2021 to represent California's 54th Assembly District, which consists of Baldwin Hills, Cheviot Hills, the Crenshaw District, Century City, Culver City, Ladera Heights, Mar Vista, Palms, Rancho Park, Westwood, and parts of South Los Angeles and Inglewood. Danielle Terry is the Director of Supportive Services for Jamboree's growing permanent supportive housing and has helped design uh, the supportive services for all the people in, the, in Jamboree's supportive housing. And then lastly, John Vu, Kaiser Permanente's Vice President of Strategy for Community Health. He is responsible for providing leadership in the development and implementation of key strategies to help deliver on Kaiser Permanente's commitment to improving the health of communities. Welcome, welcome distinguished panelists, it's a pleasure to be with you. So today we're going to start with some questions um, offered to any or all of our panelists. Um, so uh, let me just jump right in. Uh, reflecting on what we've gone through and what we've learned as a community during the COVID-19 pandemic, what is your thinking on a path forward? Where do we go from here? 
Um, and perhaps we can start off with assembly member Isaac uh, Bryan. Yeah, I, I think we need to double down on the things that are working. Uh, Project Home Key, for example, that was mentioned by Professor Painter housed 8,264 uh, people. There were nearly 6,000 new units created, over 120 sites statewide, just two in my district alone. The average cost was $129,000 per unit, which is significantly cheaper than some of the other models we currently have uh, for building that sometimes cost in excess of a half a million dollars per unit. Uh, and so we need to be thoughtful about the, the strategies that are working, that are cost effective, that are getting folks off the streets. Uh, I think we need to look very strongly at the way that houselessness falls into our entire social construction, right? We have to talk about tenant and renter protections. We have to talk about the intersections with the criminal legal system. We have to talk about the fact that over 180,000 households in LA County live at $17,000 or less a year. We have to talk about all of these things because it's not just homelessness. Uh, it's an entire network of social institutions that have let us down. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'd like to turn that question to um, Danielle and then we'll hear about the healthcare piece uh, from, from uh, John. Yes, so. definitely. I second Assembly Member Brian's comments there. I think we do have a lot of momentum right now moving forward of getting housing done quickly. Just with Jamboree, we were able to open up three home key sites and house over 300 Californians in them quicker than we ever been able to do before. Traditionally, it takes about three years to create a project and get people moving in. It took us six months. We can do it. So I think there's a the momentum. We know it works. So we need to move forward with that. We've seen a lot of public and private partnerships throughout this period of everyone coming together to solve the issue. Again, we need to play on that momentum of how we combine this funding from both sides of the house, the services from both sides and move forward. And then really, we've just seen a highlight of no one having a safety net, especially those um, that are experiencing homelessness out there on the streets right now. And it's highlighted the inequity. So we see those areas. There's been great programs such as the rental assistant program, the eviction moratorium. Again, we need to move forward on these and we know what they are. So now we need to figure out the solutions and keep going. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Vu. Yeah, I have the easy job of after Gary, the assemblyman and Danielle, just to say ditto, ditto, ditto. Um, <laughs> uh, and I agree with all of that. And those are all vital. Maybe one extra thing coming from healthcare is that mm -hmm. Uh, and not even just healthcare, but as society, um, the role that every institution um, plays um, in addressing major societal ills. And it's not going to, unfortunately, something like the issue of homelessness is everybody's responsibility, but seems to be nobody's accountability, except so we all have to figure out our rightful role in this. And then how do we kind of come together in like we have in this crisis and keep that momentum going? Um, and then the role of health systems and major hospital players, especially in their communities, um, revealed, I think, through this, uh, the pandemic, the, the need to step up as anchor institutions, to deploy your assets, to deploy our assets in ways that um, can play. Uh, Daniel, Danielle talked about the public-private partnership. I mean, we have all kinds of voice, grant-making, philanthropy, our community benefit, uh, the power of the white coat, connecting health and housing systems. Um, and I think that just revealed itself more than ever during the pandemic and we just need to keep stepping up that way. Absolutely, uh, such important themes, uh, multi-sector partnerships, knowing that we have been able to, you know, expediently house people and continuing that momentum. Um, so thank you for that. So uh, moving next to, um, you know, we just want to hear of any specific lessons that um, you learned um, as as an organization or as a community that um, that that perhaps other sectors can learn from. Um, and how about we we start with um, John for that one? Yeah, I think one critical lesson was you know the time to prepare for a crisis is not during the crisis. Right. Um, so where we have established networks, where we had good partnerships with public health, where we had trusted relationships with CBOs um, and uh, uh, elected officials, government, 
Um, that's where we were able to mobilize quickly and coordinate data, coordinate response, figure out how to bring resources together. Um, and we're trying to, we're dealing with it now with say the climate crisis. I mean, uh, the climate change, its impact is here. And so now is the time to start preparing fire, extreme heat. We're not gonna wait till the next fire happens. And so in the same way, we shouldn't be waiting for the next big pandemic. It's gonna come again. Um, um, and this crisis of homelessness or pandemic, sorry, COVID was a crisis on top of another crisis. And so um, having kind of, you're starting to do, have your ducks in a row sooner than later uh, was one valuable thing uh, for us uh, and knowing, um, activating on these uh, prior relationships and strong networks was where we were able to mobilize more quickly. Absolutely, uh, Danielle. Yes, I mean, what we're seeing from us from a housing perspective is really how we're going to build our housing moving forward. I think we have just seen a huge inadequacy of the design of affordable and permanent supportive housing. We're really at reimagining that now. We had to take everything virtual. Our individuals that are low income, some of them don't have Wi-Fi in their units, don't have the computerware. So we're really rethinking how to design and getting access to these different resources that people need now, not when another pandemic hits. We're also seeing um, the need for the physical design and who else we're bringing in to partner with. We've started partnering with health agencies of bringing actual clinics to our sites to build out a permanent supportive housing or affordable family site. We're now looking at mental health clinics coming in and physical health clinics coming in so we can meet the needs of individuals. And then just from the perspective of the system of a community from getting someone from street outreach into housing is a long convoluted process. We've seen during the pandemic of, we need to make this quicker. We need to make this seamless and it's starting, but we need to continue that and have that moving forward because we can't wait for another issue to happen. We've really highlighted where the areas that were lacking and the areas that are weak, and we need to strengthen those and not just wait and continue to seek out other models out there across the nation that are working. So we're prepared. Wonderful. Um, Assembly member Brian would love to hear your response. Yeah, I think one of the things that we're learning as legislators is, is that there's a, a need to better define the problem for constituents so that we can talk about the solutions in a way that more comprehensively uh, heads us towards our collective goals, right? If the, if the problem is defined as, as there are too many people on our streets, uh, then any solution that gets folks off the streets, including moving them to a different street, uh, or incarceration, uh, sweeping folks up or others are possible policy solutions when in actuality, they exacerbate the root conditions and social inequities that led to folks coming into contact with houselessness or housing insecurity to begin with. And so we have to think about how we talk about these issues and still be responsive to the needs in our communities, right? To, to make sure that people um, recognize that, that person who is often houseless on the street is a native to Los Angeles, Right, and you can't have a not on my street and not in my backyard and not in my city uh, mindset to all of these things. We have to think about the fact that there are more jobs than there are homes. We have to think about the fact that uh, wages have not kept up with the cost of living, let alone the cost of housing. We have to think about all of these things as we address this problem. And I think Professor Painter brought up something that's also really, really important for us to keep front and center as we redefine this problem. And that, and that is the anti-Blackness of our social institutions that has led to the conditions of having 8% of the city and county of Los Angeles being Black peoples, but over 40% of the people who are unhoused being Black people. That's not a coincidence. Uh, that's not an accident. It's not a, a cultural failure of Black folks in Los Angeles. It's, a, it's systemic design. Uh, that we have to redesign, reimagine, and rebuild, and do it in an intentional way. And we can't do that if we're not willing to call it out directly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So just to kind of reflect back on some of the themes that I've heard um, on, this, on this question. Um, firstly, be prepared. You know, don't take anything for granted in terms of what we've learned. Get those partnerships. Be innovating. Um, uh, work to uh, for work to collectively define and understand what homelessness is, what the root root causes are as a community, and address and collectively also recognize anti blackness as uh, a root cause. So um, those are really helpful responses. Um, and now I'm going to go into. Um, questions that are specific to uh, our each panelist. 
starting with assembly member Brian, um, given the public outcry and the back and forth we've seen around encampments of people experiencing homelessness in communities, uh, the anti-camping ordinances, the, the sweeps, um, how can our community move forward in a humane, equitable and productive way? And what should jurisdictions do? What should communities do? Yeah, I came out of a, an inside outside background as, a, as an organizer with the Services Not Sweeps Coalition in LA Can and a lot of folks uh, working on Skid Row and on the streets. My, my older brother lived in Pershing Square at the same time I worked on homelessness policy for the mayor of Los Angeles. And so my perspective is, is one where we cannot criminalize our way out of poverty, right? And we cannot criminalize our way out of homelessness. Uh, and so the urgency of getting folks housed is absolutely paramount. Uh, but getting folks just out of your face for a temporary period of time using enforcement citations that we, we guise under sanitation codes and others, is, it, it's, it's a difficult set of public policies because the long-term effect is, is now having folks stigmatized by the criminal legal system trying to regain any economic footing they had prior to that, trying to regain their uh, social ties and connections that they had before that, trying to uh, enter uh, the workforce uh, and maintain their behavioral and mental health to the status that they were before they had that contact. And so we have to be incredibly mindful of that um, and build again on the things that are working. We have a 20% vacancy on single family homes. There's a lot of shared supportive housing models uh, that have shown efficacy that are quicker than building in some instances. We have to keep building. Um, we have to build at a rate that is affordable to the taxpayer. I would argue that $600,000 a unit may not be the right price point. It's certainly not gonna be the right price point for measure uh, H or HHH uh, in which we've allocated just over a billion dollars in each of those over a decade. Uh, and we know the buying power of that 100 million goes down every single year, right? And so we have to be really mindful on building on what works, lowering the cost uh, of construction. And some of that can be by using surplus city, county and state property. Uh, and finding ways to do this uh, in a thoughtful and mindful way. I'm proud of the work of Project Home Key, uh, but I think there are other models that include uh, holistic wraparound services that we have to continue to build up. Um, but we're making progress, uh, and I have a lot of hope. The pandemic, I believe, has exacerbated the root causes. I'm scared of the next count numbers, to be honest with you, because I think what we've done is let a lot of people fall through the cracks over this last year, and we haven't picked everybody back up through this recovery, but my intention as a state legislator is to make sure that the state stewards all of our resources to making the, sure that those at the bottom are the ones that we invest in the most as we recover our entire uh, state of California. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So I, I'm hearing, you know, that, that criminalizing uh, poverty and homelessness exacerbates the problem um, and that we have to continue to be innovative in, not in our housing models as well as you know, keeping the cost down in building the absolutely necessary uh, new housing that we need. Um, so now I'd like to move to uh, questions directed to Danielle and John. Um, we have seen a lot of different approaches and ideas for addressing homelessness um, and homelessness issues. What types of approaches and ideas has your organization used and why did your organization decide to use those approaches? How has your organization's approach evolved or adapted to meet some of the new challenges uh, COVID has created around homelessness issues? Uh, maybe we'll start with Danielle. That's a great question. So with Jamboree in 2010 is really when we took the deep dive into providing permanent supportive housing. However, we looked at it from a very traditional housing model of developing brand new, beautiful, affordable housing with, for permanent supportive housing, and then coupling that with services. So we did um, acquire a nonprofit that was providing those mental health services to build those skill sets. And then in 2017, we really decided to make those more clinical services to follow the housing sir the housing first model and really that growing acuity of the um, individuals experiencing homelessness out there. Um, what we've seen is that the traditional model isn't the only model out there. And so really 2017 Jamboree started, we have group homes. So some, a shared living model, we've decided to do partnerships with emergency rooms of getting people out of the emergency room into housing of bridge housing, where they can recover um, with 
partnerships with the nurses from the hospital and the psychiatrists from the hospital, and then us providing housing navigation to get them permanently housed. Um, so it's really looking at this continuum of housing. It's not just one type of housing that's needed. There are a lot of different models that we need. And so Jamboree has been looking at how do we invest in these different models and build those partnerships with different agencies to move forward and not just have this brand new construction building. Excellent. Thank you so much. So that, you know, that the housing first model, of course, we know and love and, and work to maintain as a community. Um, and then again, I'm hearing innovation around share, shared housing, group homes. Um, and then, you know, that piece, uh, that, you know, it's such a great idea of a program to, you know, use that bridge housing into permanent housing and thinking about uh, a continuum uh, in terms of, of placing people eventually into permanent housing. So thank you for that. Um, John? Yeah, I like I like that too. Um, and I think for us, it's uh, it's been sort of downstream, upstream. Like, where are we feeling this issue downstream? Obviously, as a care provider with members and patients uh, dealing with the housing insecurity and people coming into our ERs and uh, facilities, uh, thinking of different ways, uh, applying like a rapid rehousing model, flexible funding partnerships that could you know have people come in and, and immediately find good uh, housing solutions. Uh, something we're implementing, figuring out ways to identify and even maybe proactively identify uh, housing insecurity amongst our members and patients. So uh, without being creepy or Orwellian about it, I'm trying to maybe look at various indicators in their medical record that could potentially uh, or develop algorithms. So we're starting to kind of look at those kinds of issues as well. Uh, then more direct partnerships, I think, with community providers and as a, going back to what I was talking about earlier, as a presence in the community or as an anchor institution, uh, providing the funding to solutions that we think uh, really start driving down uh, to zero as opposed to just throwing more good donations or trying to just do more good philanthropy. Uh, we found an organization, many of you probably heard about Community Solutions, and they have a model called Built for Zero. And their approach is to drive population level reductions coupled with quality uh, by nameless data. And that's and then an or, a community coming together across all of its sectors and its agencies to pick a North Star and drive towards that North Star with technical assistance, with coaching. Um, even through the pandemic, a place like Kern County, Bakersfield, we uh, working with Community Solutions and the Built for Zero model there, they were able to get to functional zero homelessness for chronic uh, homeless uh, population, meaning that uh, they can rapidly identify someone who's chronically homeless and, and get them into uh, the right supports as opposed to sort of lingering for a long time. Um, so that happened earlier this year, they were able to announce that in Kern County. Um, and uh, seeing what works, uh, uh, you know, or, or trying to be catalytic uh, in, in places. So in Oakland, California, for instance, uh, we said, you know, we, we saw the rising uh, tide of older, sicker uh, people who were starting to become homeless and that was starting to be the biggest population. We said, we let's fund something, work with a partner who could identify people and get them into a rapid rehousing model. We launched, you know, we're in within seven months, housed 515 people and the agency Bax was able to kind of quickly uh, uh, find all different types. And what we did was help create a flexible funding pool and help fund that. Um, then we took the learnings from that and brought it to Portland, Oregon, where we're now trying to house 300 people rapidly, a smaller place. Um, and the difference there is that the county agencies saw that model and have come together and have agreed to share data, agreed to bring their uh, services together in a different way, case conferencing and triaging in a whole different way. Again, though, what we were able to do is create a sort of a baseline sort of flexible funding pool. So it's those kinds of things. Finally, one last thing I'll mention is the use of impact investing. I think Gary mentioned social impact bonds and those kinds of things. Uh, we were able to talk to our treasury department and redirect some of our treasury asset holdings uh, to uh, equity, low capital loan, um, sort of working with various funders um, and CDFIs or community banks around the country and namely enterprise community partners. Uh, LISC is another one that we've partnered with. Uh, down there in Southern California, SDS uh, is, uh, uh, people should Google that, SDS and Kaiser. We help uh, provide $50 million in low-cost capital 
uh, that now has generated a $150 million fund, and they're going to be able to generate uh, uh, 1,800 units of permanent supportive housing um, rapidly. And you should read about the innovation there is one funding source, one developer connected to uh, 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 the data system to identify people that could fill these, working with uh, uh, churches and land uh, that churches have been able to give over for this, and cutting that cycle time way down, not having to spend 18, 24 months to find funder after funder after funder, not relying on my tech and all sorts of tax things, mm -hmm. cutting the permitting uh, period down because you're working with one developer who's got a good templated model. Um, so we're really excited and hopeful that that can kind of be a different way and approach to building and, and the, the stuff that Danielle talked about uh, as well. So lots of different things, lots of sort of uh, irons in the in the in the fire there that we're hoping to see what what works. The other last thing I'll say is evaluation um, that we want to apply good learning and research like what works for whom in what circumstances and we're going to fail on some of these or they won't reach the the levels that we hoped um, and what can we learn from those things. Oh, thank you so much, John, for all of those innovations. It's just um, excellent to hear about the work that Kaiser is doing in community um, and, and to address homelessness and, and so many different um, partnerships as well. It's a huge theme in our conversation today. So we're actually, I knew it was going to go by really fast and it's happening. So, <laughs> but let's try and get through these couple of last questions to the best uh, we can. Uh, we see intersectionality in the ways both COVID and housing instability have impacted the clients you serve, but also the outreach workers and frontline staff at the heart of this work. Given their vulnerability, what kind of protections and supports have you been able to offer this workforce? And I'll, I'll put this to Danielle first. That's a great question. I mean, this workforce is already a workforce, I think, that is more vulnerable to burnout and compassion fatigue of working with individuals on a daily basis. And then add the pandemic to this and really now this fear of physical safety and health and wellness for themselves, their families, and the, and the residents and clients they work with. So for us, I mean, it was a twofold approach. Um, one was just figuring out the physical safety um, and how to still get our residents' needs met. So that involved a lot of best practice research, PPE, working from home, and policies that I won't get into. But the second half of that is here we are working with these vulnerable populations that have been housing insecure when we ourselves are now housing insecure and experiencing mm -hmm. the exact same things that our residents are facing. So for us, it was all about providing that support and wraparound services to our staff members. And so we did create family assistance and rental assistance programs for our own staff who were struggling and had family members or spouses lose income. We also brought in external consultants to offer additional trauma-informed care trainings um, different support, especially during the Black Lives Matter movement for our team now that processing this and residents processing it, how do we hold both of these spaces? So again, we just wanted to create these platforms for our staff to talk to external um, individuals to help them walk through that process. And then I will say just on a weekly basis, every single time um, anyone from our organization had a meeting or touch base, mental health, support, self-care was mentioned and brought into that to make sure that everyone was talking about it and everyone had it on the forefront of their brains. But really it was just, it was this twofold of how do we keep them safe on site and offer our resident needs as essential workers? And then how do we handle this, the trauma that we're all currently going through, still going through, and these complicated emotions and complicated grief and just providing that safe space. It's a lot. It's a lot. Happy to hear about uh, yeah. the wraparound services and family and rental assistance and you know, trauma-informed care practices. Uh, John? Yeah, Danielle, I loved all those too. Um, I, I'll, I'll be try to be quick here. Um, one thing we activated right away was working with National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, who mm -hmm. has broad networks of healthcare for the homeless providers. And we wanted to be sure that they got the PPE, the care protocols, what quarantine and isolating looks like and get those tools out rapidly to people. We knew we couldn't kind of reach everyone and they were the experts and they had the network. So that was one thing. Um, I'll mention a couple of maybe a little more out of the box is that as you've heard about over and over again, those huge shift to telehealth and virtual care that the health providers were doing and rich hospitals and do all these, well, safety net providers and especially those providing uh, care for homeless um, didn't have the capability, the capacity, the infrastructure, so we launched uh, a, a thing called the Virtual Care Innovation Network 
to bring that capability in order to provide virtual care, telehealth, telemedicine uh, to safety net providers. So uh, that's still an ongoing development right now. So you can look that up and look at uh, how, how that's unfolding. The last thing here is to humanize this and tell the stories. And so before the pandemic hit even, we had uh, worked, we, we partnered with the filmmaker uh, to launch a, doc, um, a documentary series uh, called The Way Home to look at the issue and bring a human face to this. Who are the people that we you know, walk across every day, we hear in statistics, we see on the news and in headlines, but what are their stories really? And then of course, right in the middle of season one, COVID hit, that we pivoted quickly and the filmmakers followed the year of COVID and work, walked with the frontline people, went into the streets, went into the encampments and what were they going, what shift did they have to make to provide the basics of food, water, medicine, all of that. So that hopefully people can watch that and see the stories in real time unfold. And now as we've now have committed to season three. So after home room key, after home key, after COVID, what's what what's worked? What what did we learn from COVID and what's next? Um, so I encourage everyone to kind of look up the way home uh, documentary series. Mm-hmm. I love I love that uh, using the arts as uh, as a tool um, to connect audiences and people. Um, so I I have one last question. I know we're we're itching to get to the Q and A. Um, so but I I think it's a really important one. Uh, around the, given the, both the recent and historic criminalization of black bodies and considering the shift societies have, society has tried to make after the uprisings, how do you see your organization, our community responding to these societal transitions? And how do we enact policies that work to right um, uh, the problem? and? Uh, right societal harms instead of just not make them worse. So that disproportionality and getting really getting to to zero. Um, so we have about three more minutes to to respond to this question. Uh, I, I guess let's start with Danielle. Yeah, I mean, I just think we can't talk about affordable housing without talking about systemically rooted um, racism, biases, and segregation. I think 2020 has showed everyone that there's still a huge issue. Um, I don't know if everyone agrees still on a solution. And what Jamboree has been doing is spending our time and our resources to educate ourselves and figure out what our role is in this piece of the puzzle and really building that self-awareness, which is so pivotal in figuring out how to move forward. So we're really exploring our part of what do we do? What role are we playing in this? And then how do we move forward and enact a solution? And I think we're involved in so many areas. We're part of housing policy, actually the building of the housing. And then we do provide the services for individuals. So those direct services. So are we going to be changing housing policy? Are we going to be fighting for education and income equity, equity in our continuum of cares and coordinated entry system, since we do see such a high um, misrepresentation of across our sites. I think that's been mentioned multiple times today. So what we do know is that we want housing to be equally accessible to everyone. We want each individual in our housing to have every opportunity that someone in market rate would. And we no longer want to see this misrepresentation of populations in our housing, which is not okay. And I think it's really for us is, is starting doing this internal dive with some consultants and experts in the field, and then how do we change the system? Because the system is broken. Mm-hmm. Okay, one minute, <laughs> Mr. Vu, and then maybe uh, uh, assembly member can kind of final words. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, similarly for us, I mean, it was a, it's been a year of holding the mirror up to ourselves. And I think while we've always prided ourselves on saying that our work is grounded in equity, uh, I, we realized actually we hadn't done as much as we thought uh, and that uh, to be more explicit about it, to think about who we partner with and how, uh, who, you know, you, we may think that we'd send out an RFP for something and it's, it's equal opportunity, but it hasn't been. Um, all of those thinking about uh, data and gathering race, ethnicity data in everything we do uh, and, and looking at it uh, with a different sort of eye and lens. Um, and going upstream, as Gary and others have mentioned, around what really is, you know, upstream from housing insecurity, and that's job opportunities, education, and so doubling down on 
uh, funding capital, thinking about the ecosystem that leads to entrepreneurship, workforce training opportunities, uh, 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 opportunities and equity in um, educational attainment. So we've just sort of doubled down on um, all those more systemic issues at the root of, of housing insecurity to begin with. Thank you. And go ahead, Assembly Member Brian. I'll be real fast. Uh, we can't, <laughs> uh, I believe today is George Floyd's birthday, actually. Um, I'm gonna double check in a minute and make sure I got that right. But um, we can't wait for a national outcry and a global tragedy to, to readjust our policies and to think about what equity and justice really means. Uh, half the people sitting in the county jail system right now in LA County is the largest county jail system anywhere in the country are there pretrial simply because they couldn't afford bail. We have to look at pretrial reform and the presumption of innocence. 70% of the people in that same jail suffer from either a physical or mental ailment. One in five arrests by the LAPD is someone who is unhoused. Uh, our investment in systems of harm uh, and subjugation versus systems of care and opportunity has a complete imbalance. We can't set aside a billion dollars over a decade to solve homelessness when we spend over a billion dollars a year in the criminalization of homelessness, right? We have to think very critically about how we're using and stewarding our public resources to produce the best outcomes. I'm grateful for the Measure J coalition, although Measure J is being litigated in the courts right now, the County Board of Supervisors have still decided to invest several hundred million dollars into a care first model to build out that continuum of care. And so as we make these kinds of investments and as we think about what systems promote opportunity and well-being and which ones exacerbate the root conditions of poverty, uh, I think we're gonna start to dig our way out of these historic problems. Well, thank you so much our, to our panelists and um, I'm passing it over to Gary for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Saba, for facil facilitating a wonderful conversation. And I also wanna thank the panelists for their clear insights at what can be done um, concretely in the short term and also the long run. Um, I have a question from John Huffman. I'm gonna paraphrase it a little bit, but I think it, the point of the question is what can we do that looks like an emergency response to the number of people experiencing homelessness. He harkens back to the Army Corps of Engineers. We can think about how FEMA responds to natural disasters. Why don't we as a state, as, as communities actually um, implement solutions where we can build perhaps even temporary uh, shelters within public lands or some other approach to make sure that we have that urgency to address the fact that there's just too many people living on the streets right now? and any of the panelists can jump in with what is a first response. I think our, our, our initial problem is a, is a lack of political courage, right? A, a, a lack of courage to, to, to treat this as, a, as the emergency and crisis that it is. Um, we, we do a lot of um, complaining. Uh, we do a lot of you know, thinking about the way we like things to be, but we don't put boots to the ground in the same way we handle other crises. And we know how to do it as a state. Right. We have wildfire season every single year where it's all hands on deck. There was a point where FEMA was reimbursing for Project Room Key uh, and other initiatives, and we didn't take full advantage of it. That's when the federal government put made homelessness uh, that kind of a crisis. And so we have to we have to think about it in that way. But I would push back just slightly on, you know, erecting temporary shelters. Uh, this is not a, a problem that can be solved with solely temporary solutions. And so we have to balance our rapid response with rapid, sustainable long term responses. Uh, and I think that combination is how we're going to get out of this. Danielle? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think what we've seen right now is we need that political will. With Home Key, we had by right development. So people couldn't come out in arms saying we don't want a homeless shelter here, which these aren't homeless shelters. So we need more of that political courage to move forward with some of these ideas. And then what we've really seen is the emergency housing vouchers, which is a great response. However, there's still here in Orange County, at least we have a thousand vouchers on the streets and nowhere to put them because we don't have a thousand available units. So we need more stockpile of um, housing to get people in. Thanks, Danielle. Let me ask the next question from our audience. Uh, Moises Gomez asks, how can house neighbors um, be involved um, in kind of conceptualization of solutions? How can local businesses be involved in the conceptualization of solutions, working with those who have lived experience of homelessness and the public sector and our, our civic sector? John, I wondered if you'd be willing to answer that question first. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess coming from the, the, as a business of the private sector, um, uh, I think we've sort of jumped into this and I mentioned all the different ways. I think one way, um, I hadn't didn't talk a lot about is voice and advocacy. 
um, and uh, bringing some of our lobbying efforts. Uh, we uh, helped found, uh, worked with an organization now called the U.S. Mayors um, and CEOs. So as a public, private, how do you bring government and CEOs together to advocate for more? And this is at a federal level. Um, going to Washington and Congress and advocating for more vouchers uh, and grant support and innovative funds uh, through HUD, through HUD HHS connections. Um, and so using that voice and the power to bring public private together uh, is, is one way that uh, we, we've jumped into this. Danielle or Isaac, any uh, comments on that question? How can, how can we bring in a broader set of stakeholders? So a lot of times the private sector sits out um, and how, is there a way to kind of engage them directly other than lobbying perhaps? What we really see is um, that support and education and advocacy in the sense of for the biggest thing for building housing for individuals experiencing homelessness, it's the individuals saying, not in my backyard. We don't want it. We need the voices of the community members saying, yes, we do want this. This is a human rights issue and we need to build this housing. So we need more support and more voices coming together for that. And then I do think that public private partnership, such as Disney donated to a few of our sites to, to help build and close that gap and to provide additional services and resources that are needed. So again, it's that looking to see who's in that community and who can help and where your dollars can go. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll just say also at the state level, we uh, forged a relationship with the business community where we offered a, a homeless hiring tax credit. If you hire someone who's unhoused, we'll pay the first $17 of their wages uh, per hour. Uh, and that, that kind of an incentive, I think, is important to get the business community excited. But you shouldn't need that to see the value and the skill sets and the need uh, to, to make sure that folks who are unhoused have their way into the economic opportunity and mobility of our state. Um, but I do think it's important for the state to continue to play that role and, and not just to do it on a one-time pilot basis, but to think long-term about the lasting uh, support we can give to the business community as they play their role in helping keep our unhoused brothers and sisters working uh, and, and moving up the economic ladder. Thank you all. There's uh, one last question from our listener, Heidi Zimmerman, who works with OMA's Angels in OC. And she notes that some counties and places like LA have invested quite a bit to address the needs of our unhoused neighbors uh, by building permanent housing and, and supporting services. Uh, she's concerned that similar, I guess, public will or efforts aren't existing in, in Orange County and, and other places. What can we do to help create that support for the investments that are necessary statewide and, and not just um, what we're seeing in some of our larger metropolitan areas. Danielle, you mentioned that you you do work in Orange County. Do you have a sense of that ecosystem and as an example of what we can do in some places, which are have large numbers of people experiencing homelessness, but there doesn't seem to be the same political will? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, we we are all the way down from San Diego to Santa Clara County building, and we see each county have such a different response. And I do think we need more of this top-down leadership of what is working, getting that data out there so we can bring that and represent that in other areas, such as in LA, the Measure H funding, providing the services to go along with housing. Other counties don't have that, and it makes it so much harder to build because you can't just build the housing. You need those wraparound services with it. So I do think it is more of this getting the education out there and then lobbying for these to get on our ballots and to see these changes happen. Santa Clara has a great system of coupling supportive services dollars through um, county dollars and some of their health um, medical billers up there with the housing. We don't see that other places. So it really is coming together and using these lessons learned and getting them out there. Yeah, Assembly Member Brian, you're at the state level. How you see lots of different opinions out there about what should be done. How can we increase our efforts statewide? First, I'm just gonna say it, we've gotta get the right folks in office, uh, right? Everything that we move through the budget or through the political policy process is voted on. And if you don't have the votes, it doesn't move. And so we've got to get the right folks in office who recognize the urgency uh, of this issue. And we've got to make sure that we direct our resources in a way that's equitable. We had a situation this year at the state level where 45% of our homeless dollars um, were capped for Los Angeles, where only 45% of the state's investment could go to Los Angeles, despite Los Angeles County having 56% of the problem, so to speak. And so we've got to make sure that we're making sure that our dollars are equitable all across the state and that we treat this problem 
uh, with the same urgency, whether you live in Los Angeles or whether you live in the Bay or whether you live in Orange County. And then we've got to partner and collaborate across all levels of government. The state has to play its role, but the county also has to play its role and the city has to play its role. And I would argue the federal government needs to step in and play its role, especially given the current administration. And so that multi-level coordination is something that we can, we can continue to build out on. And one of the things that's going to help that, uh, Dr. Painter, is your, is your research. Right, showing the efficacy of our efforts, showing the return on our investments in terms of what that means for changing folks' lives, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And I think we can tell those stories and I think we're headed in the right direction, but I'm going to play uh, the biggest role that I can in helping to facilitate that. Thank you so much. And John, since Kaiser is throughout the state, I, I imagine that Kaiser is doing different things in different places. What are some of those different approaches um, that, that you might want to highlight today? Yeah, I mentioned the Oakland um, 515 people that we try to rapidly rehouse and work with a partner on that. Um, I mentioned Bakersfield and Kern County, and uh, we saw uh, we had a partner there, Community Solutions, and they built Preserve Model, and they were in this last mile, and what they were realizing that landlords um, had units available, but couldn't try to, like, they weren't totally confident yet in doing that. Um, so we helped fund a housing navigator and then help create a master contract agreement um, so that the landlords wouldn't have to take on all the risk. Um, and that was just enough to kind of tip over, um, 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 uh, sort of wrap, uh, getting a lot of people into the system um, right away. Um, and we're trying to pull from learnings from across uh, the country. We're in uh, Maryland and there's this entire new transit uh, line that's coming on and how do we create a batch of housing more rapidly um, uh, that way. And we want to bring those into California. Um, we were big supporters of HomeKey um, and, and funding the local partners who were trying to create the plans. Uh, the state helped acquire the buildings and the units, but the counties and the, the partner, local cities had to step up for the wraparound services. And so we partnered with them uh, around that across the state as well. That's great. I, I really appreciate all of your insights. Uh, Assemblymember Brian, uh, John Vu, and, and Danielle Letary. Um, I know virtually we're clapping for, for your efforts uh, that continue to actually deliver what's needed to our unhoused neighbors. As Assemblymember Brian said, in, in just in conclusion, he said, COVID was a crisis on top of a crisis. Um, we were not where we want to be back in 2020, 2019. We don't want to go back to normal. That was not acceptable. That was not tenable. Um, what do we need to do? Well, we need to think about immediate short-term solutions. We saw how Project Room Key and Home Key were able to close some gaps for people to actually house people that weren't housed before, to do it in a safer way, a more humane way than some of our previous solutions or the outcomes that people were experiencing homelessness. As I reflected before, um, we did not get here overnight. We got here in this extreme situation because of decades of either unintentional or intentional neglect in terms of what our housing system should look like, what our health system should look like. And, and unfortunately, our people have suffered because of it. What we need to do now is to think not just 10 years ahead, not just 20 years ahead, but we need to think about where we need to go and then develop concrete plans on how to get there. I was very encouraged that the state legislature, through the support of Assemblymember Brian and his colleagues, um, advanced some bills to do that. We mentioned those earlier, SB9, SB10, changing zoning, making things a little bit easier to build housing within our communities. Um, that's just the first step. There are many steps that need to happen at the local and state level, but with a collective will, we can get there. And if we actually kind of produce kind of what are the metrics we need to do in the short term, long term, and in those 20 years, then we can work together to end homelessness here in LA County and throughout the state and throughout the nation. So with that, I would like to just uh, thank everyone who was with us today. Um, I wanna mention that for those of you who um, have friends that weren't able to view, we're going to save this event and, and the recording will become available. So please follow our Twitter handles to make sure, uh, or Facebook um, to make sure that you have access to those. If you can't find them, just contact me directly and we'll be able to send you that information. Um, we will be reconvening in 2022 to really discuss some more of these concrete steps that we need to take over the next two decades. Um, 
Again, I, I want to thank my partner and the Schwarzenegger Institute for their terrific partnership in this event. And again, thank all the people who spoke and our, especially our distinguished panelists. With that, I will welcome you to uh, continue to work with us to end homelessness. Thank you so much.